Okay, there we go. So thank you everyone so much for joining um, our second featured artist of the month artist talk. Um, this month, we are so thrilled to have Miranda Blast be our um, featured artist. And I'm just gonna give a quick intro to Miranda and then I'm gonna turn it over to her to give her um, talk to all of you. And then at the end, we'll open it up for questions and discussion and all of that. Um, so Miranda is a graduate of St. John's College in Santa Fe, New Mexico, and she first encountered um, Aix-en-Provence and the Marshute School in the summer of 2015, after which she then stayed on for two more years, as many Marshutsers are want to do, um, <laughs> to learn from and work with Alan Roberts, John Gasparich, and her fellow students there at the time. Um, Miranda is a working artist in Philadelphia, focusing mainly on ceramics. Um, this past September 2022, we were so lucky to have Miranda join um, our museum seminar program in Washington, D.C., where they spent time in the National Gallery with Alan, Kathleen, Hillary, Patrick, um, and the whole group, many of whom I actually see on this meeting today. So that is really um, so wonderful. And we are just overjoyed to feature Miranda this month and, and her work and um, so excited to have her here for the artist talk today. So with that, I'm gonna turn it over to you, Miranda, to start your Great. presentation. Awesome. Um, thank you so much, Rose, for that introduction. Um, yes, so I'm Miranda Bloss. I'm a Chilean American artist. I grew up in Santiago for a little while and then in Colorado. Um, and like Rose said, I went to St. John's College. And the first time I actually heard about the Marshute School was at St. John's in my math class. We were doing like a um, Apollonius Conics kind of thing. And my professor, Mr. LeCure, started talking about, you know, sitting in a field, painting a sunflower and like talking about art at the school in Southern France. And I was like, whoa, 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 you got to stop. And I like derailed the whole class and I made him answer all of my questions. And as soon as I learned that this place existed, I didn't know very much about Marshitz at, at this time, but I, I felt called to go there. I, I knew that this was something I had to do. And it actually took me about two more years. So I found out about that when I was a sophomore and it was like percolating in my head for two years that I wanted to go to this school. I learned more about it. Um, and then after I graduated in 2015 from St. John's, I went over and did a six week program um, over the summer with Marshutes and absolutely fell in love and had the opportunity, opportunity to stay longer. So I stayed for two years and I did the Marshutes program for two years and it was just incredible. We all say this about Marshutes, but it was really life-changing. Um, and I'm gonna talk a little bit more in depth about why it was so life-changing, what makes Marshutes so special. And then I'll talk a little bit about what I'm up to now and my current practice. And I'm gonna show you some slides. I put together a nice little slideshow with some brand new photos that have never been revealed before <laughs> for all of you to um, take a look at. And, um, so I'll do that and then we can do some questions and stuff. So yeah, I was at Marshutes for two years, about two years, and it was a really life-changing experience. One of the things that makes Marshutes so different than um, other art schools is that it's a school of vision. And, and what that means to me is that you're not gonna learn some like textbook way of how to like, paint an eyeball or draw an ear or do this or that, because that's not what really we're interested in. What the focus of Marshutes, the school of vision part of it is that it's about finding your own unique vision as an artist and trying to translate that into your work. And that's a completely unique process that's unique to every single person, every single artist, and it doesn't look the same for all of us. Um, of course, there's a you know standard sort of um, curriculum, you know, we all do copies, we all do landscapes, we all do um, still lives and portraits and all of that, but it's different for everybody. Everybody paints differently and their journey to find their unique voice and vision um, is something that's unique to them, right? So Marshutes isn't gonna teach you this like one serves all, one size fits all, like how to draw a textbook style. Um, it's about harnessing your own 
power as an artist, your own vision, and moving through a very personal journey with that. Um, it's a super unique experience. Um, yeah, and it, every part of Marshoots helps feed this this sense of learn, learning vision, learning how to look at the world, learning how to look at art and at your own art and at yourself. Um, you know, when you're standing in a field in the middle of, you know, right outside of Aix-en-Provence, you know, in a field of lavender or whatever, staring at the Mont Saint-Victoire, it's a really incredible experience. And it's really hard to sit and look at something, you know, so majestic and then try to paint that. And when I'm painting, I, you know, I'm not interested in exact realism. Like that is not really my cup of tea. Other people can do that. That's fine. <laughs> I'm interested in communicating my sense of color, my sense of value, um, the sort of sense of the kind of energy that I'm getting from a motif. And I'm trying to sort of translate that through myself, through my hands, through these paintbrushes onto a canvas. And that is something um, that Marshoots is really good at teaching you how to do to guide you through. And um, a lot of that is because of the mentorship of Alan and John. I mean, I could talk forever for hours about Alan and John and their incredible mentorship. Um, some of the best teachers I've ever had and I've had a lot of good teachers. Um, one thing I'd like to highlight about the Marshoots program that really was one of the most educational experiences I've ever had, most important ones is uh, the critiques I would have with Alan and John. And what we would do is we would put up all my paintings all around um, and it would be, you know, like 20 to 30 paintings. Um, and some of you know what this is like to have all your paintings all around and sit in the studio with Alan and John one on one on one and spend, gosh, we would spend like two, three hours discussing my work. And it was just life-changing. It, it was work-changing and eye-opening to sit with these, you know, artists and teachers that have devoted their lives to sharing this approach and this philosophy and this incredible way of making art with students um, and sit there and learn about my work, learn about myself. Um, really incredible um, experiences. I mean, at Marshoots, one of the biggest things, and I wrote about this in my little bio and stuff for this too, but I learned how to live like an artist, how to really live like an artist. And I remember um, one of the first thing, one of the first meetings we had at Allen was like, okay, alors, now we're going to gonna teach you how to live like an artist. And I was like, well, I am an artist already. I already live like an artist, whatever. And it really, it really did change because before art was something, you know, it was always something I did, always something I was drawn to. I just like bubble over with art. But instead of it being something that I did only when I felt like it, um, only when I, um, you know, it was like, oh, let's do some painting or do some drawing and make some art. I feel like doing this, I feel creative. You know, that was sort of how I did art before. But once I went to the Marshoots School, it became a practice. It became something I did every day, whether I felt like it or not, whether I was super depressed, I would sit there and force myself to paint um, because it, was, it wasn't something that I just did when I felt like it, it was my life. It was a practice, it was work. And it was um, you know, really seriously academic in a lot of ways and also balanced out by being really, you know, I, I don't wanna imply that I'm not also very driven by emotion in my art. I think when you look at my art, you see feeling in it. And that's very important to my practice, you know, um, imbuing it with this sense of feeling. But at Marshoots, I really learned that you, at least for me, my life, my practice, it's all one, it's all connected together. Um, and, um, that was something really new, something that Alan and John really helped teach me. And being, you know, in a co cohort with other Marshoot students, we all developed that together and got to feed off of each other. And of course, you know, my art practice is unique to me. And so I got the chance to develop something that was really authentic and really me. Um, also guided by these really, you know, incredible um, teachers who know a lot about how to help you 
live your life as an artist. Um, so that was really um, incredible as well. And then the other really cool thing about Marshutes is not only are we based in Aix-en-Provence, which is gorgeous and incredible, as many of us know, um, but we also go on these like amazing field trips. And so we go to like the Louvre and the Musée d'Orsay and Giverny and all this, but the trip that really did it for me was um, the trips to Venice. So I actually went twice since I was there two years. And it was really the second trip to Venice. You can see some of my paintings from them. Um, that just really supercharged my practice because I was painting so much. So I'll tell you a little bit about my schedule because it's crazy. <laughs> so what I would do is I would wake up before dawn and I would go do a sunrise painting and you can see a sunrise painting here. Um, the light in Venice before right as the sun rises is just wild, really incredible. Um, so I had to paint that. And then I would go get a spritz and a gelato and I would have some breakfast and then I would go out and paint again. And I would do like a morning painting and I would have some lunch and get a spritz and a gelato and have a nap. And then I would go and do an afternoon painting and you guessed it, I would get a spritz and a gelato after that. And then we would all go get dinner together and have some wine and go walk around at night. And then I would force myself tired as I was to do a nighttime painting. And then I would get a spritz and a gelato at the end of that. So I rewarded myself every time I did a painting. Um, but this is one of the nighttime paintings that I did. Um, and for this one, I found a little trash shoot dock um, right in front of the church. This is the Santa Maria della Salute. And it's like a really famous church in um, Venice. And um, I found a trash dock like right in front of it. And it was just wide enough for my easel. And like there were like workers loading barges up with trash like the whole time I was painting. Um, but it looked right in front of, of the, the church. And so I could really engage in this kind of one-on-one -on -one portrait making with this beautiful building. And it was really, really meaningful. Um, and that's not something that you get all the time. It, you know, it's, it's rare. You have to be in Venice painting. You know, this kind of work doesn't just happen. It's part of a practice. Um, so that was really, really life-changing and taught me even more how much I wanted to spend my life making art. Um, so even though we would go sort of all over and take these field trips, we were very much based in Provence and that in and of itself was really amazing and life-changing. Um, I, you know, of course it's Southern France. You've got the wine and the culture and the food and the chocolate and everything. Um, but I also got to forge really meaningful relationships with actual real French people. So my host family that I had for six weeks while I was there um, became my real family and I love them all so much um, and we're still in touch. And so while I was going through this, um, artistic journey and this establishment of my practice I was also going through this like interpersonal journey with you know these people that would become my family and so it really sort of knit together really wonderfully um, I wouldn't have been able to you know be there for two years without the foundation of my family um, there so that was really meaningful um, so that's a little bit about my time at Marshoots. Um, Y'all are welcome to ask me more questions about it too. Um, but all of that is to say that it gave me an incredible foundation, a really unique foundation for living my life as an artist, like really truly. So I work full time as an artist now, which is amazing. I'm so blessed. I did, I was teaching full time um, and then the pandemic hit and I was able to, you know, make a bunch of work and start selling it. And that sort of snowballed into where we are now. I do live shows like every weekend, fine art shows, that kind of stuff, pop-ups, all sorts of things. I've worked in the gallery um, and it's just always growing and I'm always sort of learning more and pushing myself. Um, so I am um, currently focused on atmospheric fired ceramics, so a little bit different than what I was doing at my shoots, but still very much inspired and related to what I did there. Um, it'll be interesting to see if you can see like similarities between my paintings and my sculptures, if y'all can sort of suss that out to see, see it for yourselves. Um, 
But um, yeah, that's a little bit about me. Um, I'm wondering if we can do, if anybody has any questions, we can do a couple questions and then I can show you some slides. Yeah. And if you guys just, if anybody just wants to raise their hand to their screen, then I can maybe sort of call on people. Um, so if you have a question now, maybe turn your camera on and then sort of raise your hand like this and I can, um, unmute you or, um, you know, call on you to ask your question. Or we can just move on to your um, slideshow too, Miranda, if you're ready. Yeah, for that. if nobody has any questions, I can, I can move on. That's, that's no big deal. Oh, oh. Alan has a, Alan has a question. <laughs> Miranda. Yes. How, how was the transition? I mean, you had a transition when you came to the States to France and that. Yes. That was incredible. It was hard. <laughs> How was the transition when you when you went back? Was that did you was that difficult or was it? How did you? Oh, when I went back? back between the six weeks and the two years. No, after the two years. After. It was definitely a shock. Definitely some reverse culture shock. It took me a while to adjust. Um, I wasn't immediately working as a full-time artist. I was working at a museum and then as a teacher at an art center. And um, I mean, that was fine, but I really have realized that it's really important for me to be my own boss and be in charge of my own schedule. Um, and that has helped a lot with the, you know, I can live my life like I'm at more shoots all the time now. Um, and I wasn't really able to do that before. And so going from France, from this like, you know, really wonderful idyllic life to being in the States working, it was quite a shock. Um, but I did, you know, take everything with me, like all of my experience at Marshoots live inside me and continue to inform everything I do. And even when I was working, you know, when I was teaching, I would always try to, you know, incorporate things I had learned at Marshoots for my kiddos and stuff. So um, the transition was hard, but, it, you know, it was doable. Um, it taught me a lot. And, you know, without that transition, I wouldn't have, you know, it's all necessary to get to where I am now, uh, what I would say. Thanks. Yeah. Any other questions or should we move on to see some artwork? Yeah. I see one question there, although the name says Miranda Blast, so I'm not sure if that name to That's call totally. on. <laughs> I don't know why that happened, Miranda. And then it's below, there's another Miranda Blast below as well. But I'm curious for you to describe the motivation towards the types of ceramic, you know, the types of sculptures that you're doing now, primarily the ones regarding the celebration of women's bodies. Yeah. Yeah, it's a great question. So, and we'll see this in a second, um, but I make a lot of, and you might've seen this from, you know, the snippets that Marshmutz has shared, but I, I do a lot of figure work. I do a lot of women's bodies um, and that, so I do, the first thing I do these um, goddess vases that are these like body vases. And these are very much inspired by um, nature in the fact that they're inspired by my own body and you know years of study of myself and I wanted to create something one they sell really well so you know I have to balance that as a working artist it's an important element of what I think about but I um they're inspired by my own body they're inspired by ancient goddess sculptures like the Venus of Willendorf and the goal is to sort of you know promote um, bodily autonomy and, you know, women power and feminism and um, self-confidence in your own body. And it's just supposed to represent, yeah, that, that power that women have, that divine feminine. Um, and I make a whole series of those. I'll show you a little bit. Um, my more recent work has been some of these more reclining pieces. So this is a greenware piece. Um, and it's a reclining goddess that hasn't been fired yet, but I'm gonna show you some fired work of goddesses as well. Um, so that's sort of where the goddess thing comes from. <laughs> it's something I've always been interested in. I'm always drawn to representing women. And I think um, it's important for me as a woman to be representing women. Each time I make a portrait 
or you know a goddess figure I feel like I'm fighting back against the male gaze and you know the centuries and centuries of art of women by men and I want to add women by women um, so that's important to me yeah should we look at some slides oh okay Sienna <laughs> Um, I was wondering how, if you have advice for, like, I just graduated with my art degree and now that I'm free in the world, it's like, oh my God, there's so many options, but also I feel kind of lost with like what to yeah. do. I was just kind of wondering how you found direction after your education was over. That's a great question. I mean, my biggest advice, and this goes for whatever, is to follow your heart and follow what you're interested in. Um, so for me, like I always knew I wanted to be in the arts. And so I found work in the arts, um, but then it became really apparent that I wanted to like be my own boss and be actually just making work. Um, and that, you know, everybody has their own unique journey that they go on to find that. And, you know, I talk to a lot of people who are like going into, you know, starting to bend or doing this or that. And you just have to find what you're good at, what makes your heart sing and like commit to doing that. And there will be an audience for it. You just have to put it out in the world and people will come to it. Um, and it takes time. It doesn't happen, you know, like overnight or anything. But my biggest advice for like finding your bearings and finding what you want to do and stuff is really listen to yourself and what you're drawn to and follow that. Because what I do, I just follow my heart. Like I make what I want and I put it out there and people buy it. And it honestly always is astounding to me. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> Should we do some slides? Anybody have any other questions? I think it would be good timing to probably move on to slides. I'll do them real quick and then we can open up to more of a discussion. So I'm gonna share my screen. It might take a sec for the slides to load. Um, so just bear with me. Okay. All right, now I'm sharing my screen. I'm going here. Okay, it takes a second for it to go. Let's go. Come on. There we go. Okay. So this is a piece um, everyone can see and hear okay? Yes. Okay. <laughs> I can anyway. Great. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I got scared, so I went away. Okay. So this is um, Bust of a Goddess. It's a Raku fired piece. So let me just talk real quickly about Raku. Raku is a medieval Japanese process, but the um, contemporary process is very different than the medieval, um, you know, traditional Japanese stuff. So what I do is I coil build generally the sculptures um, and then I fire them once, that's called a bisque firing, and then I glaze them with special Raku glazes. And then I fire them in a, in a small Raku kiln, then I take the piece out of the kiln red hot, and I put it into a trash can full of newspaper with lights on fire. When I close the lid on the trash can, it becomes a reduction chamber. And what that means is that there's no oxygen present. So that um, since the oxygen isn't present in the environment, it's gonna get pulled out of the glazes and you're gonna get some really interesting effects. So here you can see the flashing of a Raku glaze that's just amazing. You don't get that every time, but that one piece reduced really well. This is a piece called The Gates of Self, which I named that because I was really inspired. I was looking at um, Rodin's Gates of Hell. Um, Philly has a great Rodin collection, so I go there a lot. Um, and I wanted to do something sort of me, but inspired by that. Um, so this one's Gates of Self, Raku Fired. This is, um, we were talking a little bit about the goddesses. This is one of my biggest goddesses. She's about 24 inches tall, um, very large. And um, you can see she's a great example of the black background that you get on a, a Raku piece. So uh, wherever you see black, that's where smoke has gotten stuck into the white clay. Um, it's not paint or anything like that. It's smoke getting stuck in the white clay. So it's, it's really interesting and it creates this really nice sort of sable, 
matte surface. There's some new shots. I mean, I love my photographer. She's amazing. She takes these incredible shots of my work. I don't photograph my own work. <laughs> um, so that's the goddess. And so these are a few shots of, a, of the goddess collection. I just wanted to add those in there. Um, this one is Raku fired. This one is wood fired. And you can tell they're very different. Wood firing has a much more bronze, neutral, earth tone effect and Raku is really bright, shiny, iridescent. So different um, effects. So these are Raku fired. And this is a series I did, I wanted to show you because it's a really interesting sort of crossover between painting and, um, and ceramic. So what I did is I did these series of Sakura paintings, cherry blossom paintings. Uh, Philly has gorgeous cherry blossoms. Um, and so um, I did these series of paintings and then I did pots that um, were inspired by the painting. So when I was sculpting these pots, I was looking at the painting and trying to impart some of that cherry blossom essence to the, um, the vessel. I particularly like the, the blossom style leaf, uh, rim on here that recall the sort of um, sakura blossoms. Anyway, um, so that's a little Raku painting sort of hybrid situation. Um, and then this is some more wood fired work back to the theme of goddesses and women. What's interesting about this piece is it was um, not glazed at all. So all of this effect is created um, solely with the ash and the flames and the heat of the wood fire kiln. So the wood kiln fires to about 2000 degrees, that's about cone 10. Um, and Raku fires to about cone 05, which is about 1,900 to 1,000 degrees. So huge disparity in temperatures. I fire all over the board. And you can see the really nice modeled um, ash effect, all of the yellow green, that's all ash that is settled onto the pot, onto the piece. Um, and that's the back. So one thing that's really interesting about wood firing is you can chart the um, movement of the flames. And so this piece was facing the kiln. And so it got a huge brunt of ash, but then the back didn't so much the flames came over the front, depositing the ash and came back down to the bottom, to the back, um, creating the bronzing. So it's a really interesting, you can see the process actively happening on the pots. Here's another one, slightly different, a little bit more color. And you can see on this one, the, the areas that weren't reached by the ash, these orange bronze zones. So those are really interesting. Um, this is a piece, um, that was inspired by nature, but um, is also a vessel. So it was a kind of another hybrid situation. Um, I was in, uh, when I was in New Mexico recently, there were all these choya blossoms and choyas are these um, uh, cacti that grow in the Southwest and they have these beautiful lobed surfaces. And so I, I made a whole series of these choya blossoms in Raku and then in wood fire. And this is sort of a triple decker version of the Choya Blossom. And you can see it's a great example of the uh, modeling that you get from the ash. And then I have some white nuka glaze um, running down as well. Um, and that's a functional vase. I like to make things that are sculptures, but that are also functional. Um, a little bit of both. I like to sort of break down the binary between craft and fine art. Um, so these are some paintings. Oh, one thing I want to show you is this little motif next to this sun. I just found that interesting. So there's sort of similar um, forms going on. So this is a piece from Venice. Um, it's called Sunrise in Venice, another sunrise piece. Um, and this was actually, I sold this at my MFA show. It was my first painting that I sold. <laughs> um, so um, that's an interesting piece. I really enjoyed making this. Um, that one is the one that's behind me, so I won't spend too much time on that. Another sunrise piece. This is a sunset piece. Um, 
from Venice. And you can see this is sort of looking out into the sunset over the more sort of industrial stuff that's sort of far away. It's not the like pristine, like the pretty churches and stuff. It's more of the um, industrial part of Venice. Um, and this is the painting I have behind me. I talked a little bit about that. Um, another night painting and a sort of portrait of the Salute. And then this is a series that I did um, from the street in my the street that my studio was on. Um, and some of you will know that Mana, the um, well, they moved, but Mana was on the street. <laughs> so a lot of a lot of us know it. <laughs> um, and then these are a couple portraits of my parents. Um, these are more recent. So the Venice paintings are like 2017. These paintings are 2018, 2019, around there. Um, and then uh, a raccoon piece. So this one's called the Triumvirate and it's a three-sided, there's three different figures, another sort of goddess theme. And there's, um, some of you might recognize this lady as inspired by the Giselbertus Eve Lintel. Um, I work with that motif quite a bit, actually. Um, and so that's all my slides. Thank you so much. I'm gonna go back to showing my face now. <laughs> all right, so now we can open it up to more general questions, discussion. If anybody has any questions about the art, I could also show, um, go back to the slides if we need. I have some more artwork around here that I can pick up and show you as well. So yeah. So beautiful, Miranda. Thank you so much for sharing those slides. So great. Um, I have a quick question. I wonder how, when you are sculpting or you're creating like one of those bases, like the gates of self, for example, mm -hmm. how do you feel the process and the sort of touch relates to how, when you know the process of painting so when you're creating a, a vessel or a piece how does you know how does your artistic touch relate to what you've learned at Marshoots and then also just as you've painted beyond that how are those two practices yeah. related absolutely so my ceramics practice and my painting practice like I don't consider them separate things they're one and I mean they're very different like it's very different to be painting on a flat surface than to be doing ceramics you know paint you put on the canvas and it stays pretty much how it is glaze does not do that it changes completely um so when I'm working on like a sculpture or a pot or a painting or really anything my approach is always the same and it's that I'm trying to create something whole and living, and I try to work at it sort of all at once. You know, um, it, this reminds me of the Corot quote about blowing a bubble, right? Like the bubble, when I paint, I try to blow a bubble and the bubble is very small, but it's already spherical, it's already whole, it's already there. So when I'm making a painting, you know, I try to work on all parts of it at once going around the whole surface. When I do a sculpture, I try to do the same thing but the media of clay, the medium of clay requires that you make certain things first. So it's hard, you know, if I'm making a sculpture, like a standing figure, like I, I have to make the legs first because otherwise the torso won't have anything to stand on. I can't just like make it all at once because of gravity. Um, so instead of working on like all parts of it all at once, because I, I just physically can't do that with clay all the time, I try to get the whole figure up as quickly as I can and then work to create a whole living form. So I'll, you know, if I'm making a goddess, I build the whole thing out of coils and then I get the whole form. And then I sort of go around the whole thing, pushing in, pushing out, adding clay, um, additive and reductive sculpting all around to get the overall form that I want. I don't do the face and then the feet and then the hands. I sort of do a little bit here and then a little bit there and then a little bit there and see how it relates. And, and in addition to that, I also am always thinking about all the steps of the process. So ceramics is a very um, process and step stage oriented um, uh, 
process. So you have to do certain things first and certain things later. Um, but just try to combat that or try to stay in that like bubble zone where it's all happening at once. I'm like birthing this living thing sort of, it all has to happen at once. I try to keep all of that in mind. So when I'm sculpting something, I'm, you know, out of raw clay, I'm thinking, what, how am I going to glaze it? How is this going to fire? How am I going to pick this up out of the kiln and put it in a trash can if it's raccoon? How is this going to interact with the ash and the flame in the wood kiln or whatever it is I'm doing? I'm thinking ahead and I'm picturing in my head everything that's going to come in the future. So when I'm like, for example, when I'm glazing something, so I can show you, I made these Saint Victoires. And these are raku fired. <laughs> um, and so when I was glazing these, I mixed up a palette of glaze um, and I created the unique colors using the mason stains, using basically just red, green, and blue. I mean, red, yellow, blue. Um, and then I painted it, but I had to imagine in my head what the glazes were gonna look like once fired because glaze changes at first, it looks really chalky and matte. And then it looks really nice and shiny and dark. And so these colors were completely different. So I had to create a color harmony with the chalky matte versions, imagining, trying to sort of, you know, prophesize what the glazes would look like in the future. Luckily, I can, you know, I have a pretty good idea what certain glazes do. I've been doing this for a while, but it's always a surprise. I'm never exactly sure. So this is sort of how that turned out. I shared the process of this on my Instagram. So you may have seen what it looked like before it was fired. Um, that's the bottom, that's the inside. Um, so that's a little bit about how my painting and ceramics go. Like what, whatever I'm doing, I'm approaching it the same way. The Marshoots way <laughs> and the Miranda way. <laughs> Thank you, that's so helpful. Yeah. Are there any other questions for Miranda? Feel free to raise your hand like this, either myself or Miranda can call on you. Jennifer, do you have a question? You'll have to turn yourself off mute before you can ask. There you go. Oh, I was wondering if you could talk about how you got into ceramics and how um, that became your basis for your primary um, medium for now. Totally. That's a great question. So I've always been in ceramics. I mean, I've, I've, all, I've did it in high school. The first time I did Raku was actually in high school. I did it, you know, all throughout my life. I was the pottery assistant at St. John's. And while I was at Marshoots, I was like, Alan, John, you got to get me into a clay class. And the whole first year I was like, ceramics, ceramics, ceramics. And then we organized the little hookup with a local um, ceramic studio and I went there. Um, and then when I came back to the States, I became a member at a community studio and really committed myself to doing ceramics every day. Um, I don't really, I can't, I don't know if I can really put into words I'll try, I'll try. Why I love ceramics so much, what brought me to it. I really love working in three dimensions. I always have. I mean, I like working in two dimensions too. Obviously I, I went to more shoots for it, but um, three dimensions has always really called to me. Ceramics is really physical and really tactile. And that really speaks to me. I love being able to make my work directly with my hands, leave my fingerprints in it. And that's gonna last forever. That's a really, you know, my touches literally in the thing, you know, it's in the pot. I made that with my hands and you can have that sense of touch in the piece. Um, so it wasn't so much a process of me saying, oh, I'm done with painting. I'm gonna do ceramics, I'm sick of this. It wasn't like that at all. I still love painting very much. Um, but it, it was sort of a, a gradual um, deepening into something that I already loved and wanted to pursue more academically and more seriously. I wanted, like I had built a painting practice, I wanted to build a ceramics practice. And then in terms of like my work, like my, the jobbiness of it, ceramics sell really well. And so it was not hard to be like, okay, I'll make more. <laughs> and I'm always trying to like, I don't want to just make mugs and plates and, you know, like I'm, I'm not a potter. 
I'm, I'm not a production potter. I'm not, I'm not even a ceramic artist. I'm an artist that works in a bunch of different media. And when I do ceramics, I want them, you know, to be one of a kind living whole artworks, whether that's a mug, whether that's a sculpture, whatever it is, I'm approaching it the way I approach a painting. So painting and ceramics to me are very closely related, especially because a fundamental and one of my favorite parts of ceramics is the glazing process. And I usually, apply my glaze with a brush because of my painting background. So there's a really painterly paint brush felt touch to my work. Like you can really see in these mountains, like I used a paintbrush and applied this glaze and you can really see the paint strokes. Um, I hope that answers your question, Jen. Yes, thank you so much, Marianne. Yep. It's lovely to hear you talk. Thanks. Sharon, do you have a question? You'll have to unmute yourself as well. Okay. Well, I have, a, I guess, an observation as much as a question. I found it really interesting, Miranda, to see your painting of the cherry blossoms and how you use that as kind of a, a roadmap in creating your, your cherry blossom vases. Mm -hmm. that extraordinarily interesting. Hey. And, I could see where you had areas in the vase that might have represented the uh, branches and of course all the blossoms and I was just wondering is th is that a was that an experimental approach or do you use that approach where you work from the painting into the vase on other other series yeah um it was experimental as I was doing it um, and it is something I like to do. I don't always do it, but I, I love to do that. So um, the mountains, I'll show you a different one. The mountains I did in the same way. So I looked at my paintings, I looked at some Cezannes and I looked at some images and I looked in my head at memories of the Saint Victoire. And so I was working from paintings to a three-dimensional sort of situation. So um, it's definitely something that I like to do a lot. I think it's a really interesting process and it's something I want to explore more. Like I'm always getting more ideas of how to do paintings with ceramics. Um, and I, I, you know, I could just do like, you know, ceramic paintings, right? Just flat things, but I want to push myself further to do something sculptural that's also painting. So I'm always sort of thinking about that and noodling over it. Um, I think after this talk, I will probably do um, a painting uh, vessel sort of hybrid. Um, do you ever do you ever go in the opposite direction, where you want to do a painting? painting? Yeah, yeah, I have. You know, I'll do like still lives and stuff of ceramics I've made that direction doesn't excite me quite as much. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, of course. Any other questions? Yeah. Celine, not Miranda, but um, <laughs> what's typical for a painter? And then what is your, what is your process for painting? Do you sketch first, like do pencil sketch or are you, do you just go right with paint to canvas? That's a good question. So when I paint, I definitely do a lot of sketches first. I always tell all my students and like little kids I meet that drawing is the foundation of all art. So I always start with a sketch. I'll do several. I'll do one that's a little bit more in depth. I'll do one that's a bit looser. That's more of a gesture of the motif that I'm working on, you know, whatever it is I'm painting. Um, but then generally I just go straight in. Um, I don't tend to draw on my canvas. Occasionally I do, but like for these paintings, I didn't draw anything on here. I did several sketches and then I just went straight on to the um, painting and I start with the darkest values first and then sort of move up um, value wise. And then I try to leave, like you can see in this painting and in this one to a certain extent that I'm leaving the, the white space to become sort of the light, you know, there's nothing lighter than the white canvas. Like I, the white paint is not lighter than the white canvas. So the light, white canvas is the lightest value I can have. So I'm trying to leave that 
to become sort of the light reflected off of this building. Yeah, you can see it a little better. Um, and um, that's something I try to do whenever I'm painting. Does that answer your question, Celine? Good. Yeah, Oliver. Hey, Miranda. Um, I Hi. Love, hi, I love your uh, <laughs> subject matter. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about how you select subject matter and what is kind of brewing in your imagination now for ceramics, especially. Totally for ceramics, you mean? Um, yeah. yeah, that's a great question. A lot. So it's uh, it comes from a lot of different places. Um, one, nature. Very much inspired by nature. Very much inspired by bodies, women's bodies part in particular. Um, and so I do a lot of looking, looking at others, looking at myself, um, and that's a lot of inspiration for me. Um, I get a lot of inspiration from my feelings. I have really big feelings, as many of you know. <laughs> um, but I um, get a lot of inspiration from that. So I like to sort of depict this, this like light and dark, these big sort of feelings that go on inside of me in my work. Um, I also, uh, subject matter, I mean, I, I just, sometimes I'll just get an idea for a piece and I'll just make it or I'll, a form will sort of float up into my consciousness and then I'll make that. Um, I like to also reference art history a lot. So I'll show you this piece. This is a functional piece. It's not fired yet, so you, it's not the final one, but this is a cauldron mug. And so this piece is inspired by medieval cook pots. And so it's made in the traditional way that it's, it's thrown on a wheel and then hand finished and, you know, um, round out the bottom and pull the um, different elements that you add on. And so I'm very inspired by traditional processes, um, by, um, art history, um, by myself, by nature, by things I've already done. So I like to sort of do series and reiterate, like I, I'm doing a lot of the slumbering goddesses. I've done a lot of those. I keep doing them. Every time I do them, they're different. Each time it's a little bit better. So I like to work in series and sort of re sort of take on the same subject matter and do it slightly differently every time. I think doing series of things are really important. But at the same time, while I do a series, each piece is unique. Like I'm not making a production line of pots or mugs or anything. Everything is one of a kind. Um, and that's really important to me. Does that make sense? I have another question. Oh, and then Alan, I'll let you go. Yeah. <laughs> um, I was just gonna ask quickly, um, how often are you surprised by what you pull out of the kiln or out of the trash can or whatever it might be how often do you say wow that doesn't look anything like I thought it was going to look like or you know which parts of it there's it seems like there's so many different um variables how often do you get yeah so I'm surprised pretty much every time I fire something I mean when it's really good I'm surprised because okay so I have an idea of what I'm gonna get it doesn't always get go that way and then I have like the ultimate that I'm aiming for, which I can show you a little bit. So this is a Raku mini goddess and you can see those beautiful colors. Those are um, chemical reactions. This doesn't happen every uh -huh. time. You can see on the other side, very different. Hmm. A little bit more gray, a little bit more matte, but on this side, ooh, ah. <laughs> so I'm surprised every time I was surprised to see this. I was surprised to see that. Um, the mountains I was a little bit less surprised about because those are different glazes and but I was a little bit surprised that um how at the color harmony that came out um so yes every time I'm surprised sometimes I'm surprised in a good way sometimes I'm surprised in a bad way <laughs> but that's what I love about Raku and wood firing and atmospheric firing in general is you never really know what you're gonna get like I have an idea and I have a goal in mind but it's always different like you can't track these flashes like they just happen um so yeah frequently that's one of the reasons I fire so often is it's like it's Christmas every time I open the can <laughs> so great yeah Alan did you want to ask your question
Wow, Miranda, incredible. The whole thing. Painting of the, I would love to just talk about that painting of the, uh, how you did the painting of the blossoms, amazing. But, you know, I've got sort of several questions. Do you, you know, one, why do you think that your goddesses sell so well? Do you think it's really, do you, one, two, two, do you, because you don't, or do you think about doing paintings of goddesses? And three, your color, I'm just interested because when you paint, you don't have a form there to start with and you're, you know, you're using your color uh, already before you have a form. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. When you do the color for, I find it fascinating because when you get to the ceramics, you've got sort of the form there and then mm -hmm. you apply the color. Are you sort of, when you apply the color, are you sort of trying to link the color to the form or are you trying to link the subject matter? Yes. Not doing it at the same time. That's very interesting. Yeah, yeah. So it is separated in time, but in my right. head it's not. So when okay. I'm when I'm building something, so when I've been talking about the mountains a lot, but when I built this, I knew in my head that it was gonna look like this. I knew I, what glaze I wanted to use. I knew what colors I wanted to use. I knew what paintings I wanted to reference. And so when I was building it, I was thinking about what color I would put where. And so that's an essential element of my ceramics process is that in my head, I've got all of the sort of stages that are separated in time all together in my head. So while ceramics, you have to do things at different times, like in a painting, you're using color, you're making the form, it's already unified because it's, you know, just there. With ceramics, you have to bisque and then you have to glaze and then you have to fire and it's going through all these changes. I try to mitigate that by having all the information about the piece sort of concurrently, simultaneously going on in my head while I'm making it. So to me, the color and the form are not separate. They are united and I'm trying to bring that out. Yeah. Yeah. And the goddesses? And the goddesses, well, okay. I think they sell because young women like women shapes like it's just popular um but another reason that i think they sell is they came from a really personal place they came from my heart and um i think people can see what is what you put your heart into you know i i spent a lot of time sort of developing the series and every time i make it i have fun and every time i make it they're unique and they're not just this like, you know, skinny lady that looks like everything else. It doesn't look mass produced. It's handmade, you know, goddess body. I think there's something really powerful about that. Um, it's also, you know, a nice size base. It's a good gift. I think that goes along with it. So some of it is like commercial capitalism stuff that why they sell well. But I think the fundamental reason is that I really put my heart into it. And I make it with a lot of love and a lot of meaning for myself. And I think people um, feel that and see that. That would be my answer. Thank you. Yeah. Are there any last questions? I want to be mindful yeah. of the time. We're coming up on oh, the yeah, hour. Oh, yeah, we're almost there. Oh, wow, that was quickly. <laughs> All right. Does anyone have any last questions or comments from Miranda? Oh, yes. Um, Chris, go ahead. Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yeah. It's so good to see all these people here. And I just want to say my, my heart and my eyes are full. Um, your great grandmothers, who were both artists, would just be... My mom. <laughs> oh, I'm Miranda's mom. Um, <laughs> and I think, I think Grammy's on here too. And I just, I want to say to Rose and Alan, thank you for existing. Thank you for being there from when Miranda told me about Marshoots and said, I feel called to there. And you all answered that call and I'm so proud of you. And I'm, I'm just excited to see what you make next. Thanks. I love you.
Oh, I love you too. Thank you everybody so much for coming. It really just means the world for me. Thank you so much. Um, I think we're kind of right at, at time. Yes, um, thank you so much, Miranda. We, we appreciate you. Oh, Corinne, do you have a question before we head off? Make sure to unmute yourself to, um, to ask the question. <laughs> I, it's, it's not really a question. It's more just um, after Chris, because I'm, I, I was, um, well, I am uh, Miranda's host mom, um, she mentioned before. And I just want to thank uh, Marshoots for sending her to me. And uh, because uh, it was it, it was life changing for us as well to welcome Miranda and today to see how she's thriving and, and uh, the evolution of her um, journey in art. So I just, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm getting emotional, but <laughs> just, I just want to thank Marshut uh, and all the teachers and, 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 uh, and Chris. And, 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 and all the people who made it possible to, to meet such a fantastic human being. And uh, we're just looking forward to all the things she will uh, bring to our lives, pots and, and, um, and uh, paintings, because uh, uh, it's, it's just fantastic to have met her and to have her in our lives. And thank you to Marshitz for that. Merci beaucoup, Mama. <laughs> and so thank you sweet. to people. Oh, so sweet. Thank you all so much for coming and thank you, especially Miranda, um, thank for you, sharing Miranda. your practice with us. So beautiful. Yes. Thank you, I really down. appreciate it. And down. I just want to do a quick little plug before everyone signs off. Um, we are hosting programs in 2023, one to Venice, where Miranda just spoke about um, with her with her practice that's open. These programs are open to everyone of all ages. So if you're interested in coming and having a little slice of the experience that Miranda had in Venice or in X, um, take a look at our website. I'll put it in the chat. Um, and we'd love to have all of you come and, and um, do some painting with us and, and learn about the Marshoots experience a little bit more. Um, and I also wanna say that our, um, our featured artist of the month for next month for November is gonna be Nick Velleman. Um, so look out for more information. He's on this call somewhere, I believe. Um, so look out for more about him um, and Miranda's talk will be recorded. So feel free to share it, um, share it far and wide with your friends and family. And um, yes, we hope to see you all again soon. Thank you so much. Thank you, Miranda. You have been Thank wonderful. You. Bye, everyone. Thank you, Miranda. Beautiful. Thank you, Alan. Thank you, Rose, so much. Thank you. Talk to you all soon. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. <laughs>